Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to Season 3. On this week's episode... I'm joined via Zoom by Dr. Michael Burns. He's a physician scientist and hemonc fellow at Northwestern University, and he is the second trainee to come here for Journal Club with a Trainee. We're going to talk about the HERO study. This is a randomized control trial of Rulugulix, which is an oral GNRH antagonist. And I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but by the end of this podcast, you're going to know the truth. I don't need to pronounce it correctly because this is a drug that's not going to get much use. So stay tuned for that great discussion. It really makes one think of that quote, you either die a hero or live long enough to become the villain. But first, I'm going to talk about a new paper that came out in PNAS. This is a paper that I believe is on a very important issue, an issue that we need to do a lot of societal reflecting about. But it's a paper that has some structural and methodologic problems, and I want to separate these two things, how we can both be devoted to important causes, but also be appropriately critical of information that may not prove what the authors believe they have proved. So that's what you're going to get on this week's plenary session. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad, MD, MPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. First, I was... On Twitter, and something caught my eye. It was a tweet for a news story that had a very provocative title. Here's the title. Black newborns more likely to die when looked after by white doctors. And here's what it says. Black newborn babies in the U.S. are more likely to survive childbirth if they are cared for by black doctors, but three times more likely than white babies to die when looked after by white doctors, a study has found. Dr. Hardiman, one of the authors, said on Twitter, quote, Our study provides the first evidence that the black-white newborn mortality gap is smaller when black MDs provide care for black newborns than when white MDs do, lending support to research examining the importance of racial concordance in addressing health care inequality. So that's what caught my eye. And I actually did a deep dive and I read the paper and I read the supplement. And then I came out and I spent a lot of time trying to craft a Twitter thread and ultimately two threads, one on this particular paper and one on sort of the broader space we're talking about that seek to do two things. One, I want to talk about the equity and justice cause and why that's so important. Two, I want to talk about the specific claim being made in a specific research study and why that is very dubious and uncertain and why we might not want to anchor onto it without substantive additional corroborative evidence and why having these two positions are not incompatible but rather fundamentally compatible they're compatible because they're both motivated by a quest for a just fair and truer world so let me take you through that so right off the bat um i think you know this was a very important um story it has uh when i last checked 50,000 retweets and comments and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of likes and so it's getting a massive sort of um dialogue it's starting a massive dialogue and and that might be very important but i guess the question is whether or not this finding is is true and actionable and so that's what i want to talk a little bit about um so first before we get into this paper in particular i want to talk about my feelings on this topic Um, So I'm in a very unusual position here because I am a advocate for the cause. Um, I am a believer in the cause. I'm a believer in the cause. And what is the cause? I think the cause is um, we have a huge um, imbalance and injustice in the people who are matriculating and graduating and becoming doctors and particularly those who are holding key positions of power in the medical infrastructure. There is a huge imbalance, and it exists across several dimensions. One, clearly the racial dimension, um, black physicians, uh, other underrepresented minorities like um, persons from a Latinx background or Native American uh, physicians are severely underrepresented in in our medical system, 
And that is clearly the product of immense structures that perpetuate racism. Um, there is no doubt in my mind about that. And there is an important need to correct that imbalance and to have medical school graduates be as diverse as all of us. Um, that's not the only dimension. I think I, I think we have to also acknowledge some of the other dimensions. The other dimension for which there is bias is gender. Um, the other dimension is gender identity. The other dimension is sexual orientation. Um, there is imbalance in all these things. And then the other dimension is socioeconomic status. I think there's a statistic that I saw very recently, which was the percent of matriculants in medical school that are from families in the upper echelon of income. It is extravagantly high. Um, in contrast, people from poor families uh, don't often have the same ability to become a doctor. And that's really important because becoming a doctor is a mechanism for upward mobility in society. So I think that's all of those dimensions need to be ameliorated in our matriculation processes. We have a huge problem there. Why do we need to correct that? I guess I want to say that having a medical workforce that looks like America, um, that is a virtue in and of itself. I mean, that is a goal in and of itself. It, it would be wrong to have a workforce that doesn't look like America, that is preferentially loaded with people from high SES backgrounds um, who are uh, more likely to be from majority uh, uh, groups. Um, I think that that is just fundamentally wrong. It speaks to um, a, a, a severe um, problem in terms of how we allow people to flourish and join a profession that benefits um, from diverse voices and perspectives and different backgrounds um, immensely because it is fundamentally a human profession. It's, it's a profession for which someone's human background um, has a profound effect on how they practice. And so, you know, I just want to, I just want to open and close that discussion that, you know, I, I, I'm a, certainly a big believer that we ought to have a diverse workforce. So let's put that aside. The reason we put that aside is because you can believe something, but you want to be very careful, I think, in those beliefs that evidence you cite for it or arguments you make in support of it are very, very strong. And the argument I'm going to make in support of, of my belief is that it is a virtue in and of itself. Um, I do not believe one has to show secondary effects that are beneficial to have a medical school population that looks like us all. I think if you want to do that, you're playing a dangerous game because you're conceding something to those who disagree, which is that we ought to prove that having a diverse workforce improves outcomes. We don't have to prove that. That's not on the table. That is an excessive, irrational standard. No one ever had anyone prove that a workforce that was predominantly one race and predominantly men for all these years improved outcomes. Um, one should not have to prove that having a workforce that looks like everybody is going to improve outcomes. That's the wrong um, fundamentals uh, for having this discussion. So that's my that's my starting point. Now let's let's take a look at this claim. Um, this is a paper that I think is um, deeply problematic, um, and and I want to talk a little bit about why. Um, when when a mother comes into the hospital to give birth to a baby, there are a couple different paths that, that could happen. One, it could be a scheduled um, delivery. Um, uh, the, the mother could be brought in um, potentially a week or two weeks um, after the due date for an induction. The mother could be brought in um, for a scheduled C-section. In those cases, um, uh, there may be a visit paid to the mother by the patient's outpatient doctor. Um, those are, are not always doctors that are paired at random, but you have some control over who your outpatient doctor is. You might have learned from a friend, a colleague, a family member who you want as your outpatient ob -GYN. Additionally, many people particularly people who are well-off socioeconomically, they may also have preferences for which pediatrician they would want. I don't know this to be true, but I suspect there's always the story of the pediatrician who took care of both mother and child. I bet if you looked at those pediatricians um, and those children and mother pairings um, or father and child, um, those are probably higher socioeconomic status families uh, where you know you can have the same pediatrician your dad had. You know, um, uh, I, I suspect, um, but you know that's that's an interrogatable hypothesis. Um, but certainly, people do have preferences, and people do sometimes pick pediatricians and OB/GYNs, and. There's this variability to birth. Some birth is unpredictable, but some birth is scheduled. Okay, so these are two factors. The next thing is 
babies often do well. Most babies do well. Mortality rates, infant mortality rates are low in this country. Are they as low as they should be? No. Is there a huge gap between um, black babies and white babies? Yes. Uh, black babies do have worse infant mortality outcomes. That is lamentable. But the claim being made in this paper is that that gap in part is attributable to the race of the doctor who's providing care and that white doctors are going to have much higher rates of death. I say much relatively, but of course, absolutely, these are very, very low rates of, these are very, very small differences that the, the study is claiming that are statistically significant because the sample size is massive. Um, but a black baby is going to have a higher rate of death if he or she is cared for by a white doctor than a black baby being cared for by a black doctor. That is a claim that speaks to either one of two things, that black doctors are providing um, superior care for black babies or white doctors are providing inferior care um, simply by virtue of the fact that the baby is black. Um, and that is a very, I think, strong claim to make. Um, either way would imply that there is hidden racial animus among the providing doctor against the baby um, leading to that outcome. I mean, I don't see any way around that, that either scenario suggests some animus um, uh, some decisions that are being made differently simply by virtue of the baby's color of skin. And that is um, a highly provocative claim that not just that there would be such decisions, but those decisions would rise to the level that it is contributing to mortality differences in a, in a child who overwhelmingly is likely to survive and grow up because infant mortality still is a paucity. It's a rare event. It's not a common event. It's a very provocative, provocative claim. Um, ways that you might make this claim are to show that white doctors make different decisions, that the different decisions they make are decisions that do have large effect size differences in outcomes, and that you see the difference in outcomes. You know, to show me the intermediary endpoints are changing. This paper doesn't do that. It's an administrative data set, large data sets, looking at this problem from 30,000 feet in the sky. And the problem with looking at it from so high is you so easily can mislead yourself and you can find signals that don't tell the story you think you're finding. They're telling a different story and you are not teasing that out. And I fear that is what the authors here are doing. I'm telling you a little bit about the background of how babies are born. Some are scheduled, some are elective. The next thing, babies that do well, they may be seen on hospital day one or hospital day two by a pediatrician who may put in a billing note. Um, they may be seen by the doctor who delivered the baby or maybe a different doctor. Um, many hospitals now running on constantly changing teams so that the pediatrician seeing the baby on day plus one and day plus two, they're totally different babies. Day zero, uh, that ob might be a different ob than the ob team that comes along on day plus one to check on the mother. I mean, these might all be different people. Um, often, doctors that are selected to care for children, particularly pediatricians or ob they will pay a personal visit to some patients and maybe drop a note in the chart. Um, that's going to be for families that have taken the time and energy to build those bonds before childbirth. Um, they're not going to do it for everybody. The next thing that you need to know is that when babies get sick, particularly early on, they are going to be transferred to intensive care units, particularly the neonatal ICU. There, they'll be cared for by a neonatal ICU doc. If, in the unfortunate circumstance, the baby were to pass away in the NICU, one of the potential doctors of record would be the NICU attending who is responsible for the discharge summary or death summary in this particular case. Um, that bakes into the equation an added complication, which is that this paper does not ever tell you who and how the pairing is made. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But if the pairing is the discharge attending, then babies who die are going to be much more likely, I suspect, to have a discharge attending that's a NICU attending than babies who live. We're going to have a discharge attending who is a ob doctor. They're going to have a different attending. And the racial makeup of those specialties, which may themselves be a product of structural racism, um, they may uh, transfer to the analysis and suggest it is the race of the doctor that's leading to the bad outcome, when in fact it is that the place the baby goes before the baby is a discharge or died has different composition racially of doctors. And that is an artifact that is falling and being treated as if the doctor is exerting some racial animus against the baby. Um, I think that's a potential bias here. Okay, but let me talk about the three challenges. The first challenge, of course, is that the entire paper rests on the idea that physician-patient pairing is quasi-randomized. They say quasi-randomized a lot. There are a lot of papers that make this claim, but as I have told you, it is 
almost likely the case that some subset of these interactions are not quasi-randomized. They are, in fact, chosen, that the patient and their family are choosing the ob and choosing the doctor to some degree. I doubt many people are choosing their NICU attending, but I do think many people might be choosing their pediatrician. I think people who choose tend to be richer, well-educated, more connected than people who don't choose. People who are poor and don't have a lot of means, they don't pick. They get whoever comes. But people who are wealthier, they have more options to pick people. And some of those people may be coding in the chart. Um, I say in my thread that it's possible that wealthier black families may be more likely to seek out practices with black physicians or specific black doctors than poor black families. And thus it might be a socioeconomics that's being captured by this analysis and not the racial pairing per se. Um, to complete the idea of the first challenge is, of course, who is being paired with the patient is of vital importance. If it was the last doctor who saw the baby, then you're baking in all the problems of where the baby is passing away versus the babies who are alive, which specialty are leaving, which specialty is, are discharging them. If it's the first doctor, you have the problem of that might be a doctor being picked. If it's the doctor who does the most of for the care, um, that's a challenge because who decides what's the most? Who decides? From administrative billing records, the doctor who bills the most might not be the doctor who does the most. Next problem. The second core challenge is ascribing the outcome of a child, a single child, to a single doctor who is the, quote, admitting doctor of record. That's all they say. They don't tell me who this doctor is. They don't even tell me if it's the same specialty across all the babies. It's a different specialty by different, some babies, it's a pediatrician, some babies, ob guy. I don't know who this admitting doctor is, but I do think that the care of a baby being born in a hospital does not have one doctor. It's got a lot of people. It's got a doctor who is part of the ob guy team who says hello on day one. There's a doctor on day two of the ob guy team, maybe not even the same doctor. There's an anesthesiologist who may be doing a um, spinal block. There's a pediatrician on one day, a different pediatrician on the other day. There's a doctor in the NICU. If you go to the NICU, there's so many different doctors and there's doctors popping in to pay a visit, like your outpatient ob guy doctor, or your outpatient pediatrician. There's so many doctors and there's not just doctors. There's nurses too. There's all this staff. There's house staff in the hospital. There's all these people. and all these people have all these different races. And and if one were to postulate that the race of the doctor is influencing the outcome of a child, why is that not also being postulated for the race of the nurse, the race of the resident, the race of the intern, the race of the anesthesiologist? These could all be playing a role. I think the reality is there are so many players here that it seems very difficult to attribute the outcomes of a child to any one person in particular. It's like when we all put our hands on the Ouija board. There's so many people pushing that it's hard to know who is actually guiding the care of the child. Next. Um, so to, and to talk more about this, I think that anytime you try to make these pairings, those are going to be debatable. And those are not going to be the kind of pairings one would make if you had access to the charts, the actual EMR charts versus access to administrative billing records. They're going to be fundamentally different. And I think they're artificial. I think it just can't be done. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village of healthcare professionals too to take care of a baby being born. It's not one doctor. The third challenge. The third challenge is the challenge I alluded to in the beginning, which is that, yes, we need more black and underrepresented minority physicians. Yes, we need more lower socioeconomic physicians. Less, we need more marginalized groups based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and more. There are many dimensions that can't capture our workforce should be diverse. However, we cannot concede to people who are anti-diversity that diversity has to prove mortality benefit. That is a tall bar, and that is a standard not held for majority parties for hundreds and thousands of years. That wasn't the way in which we, we held the rule. We made the rules. Okay, so we raised these questions and that there was a vigorous debate on Twitter about these, about these methodologic concerns. And there were some people who pushed back on this saying that um, the results were so robust that even if this problem existed, um, it wouldn't explain the results. And you need to explain the results if you think this is problematic. And then I said, you know, if I'm perfectly honest with you, I don't know. I have no idea how they're making the pairings. And Willie Jalad emailed the first author of the paper. The second author of the paper was tagged in all these tweets. Um, the only reply I got was sort of hashtag distraction or something that asking this question was a distraction. Um, I don't have the answer to the question. And, and many of the proponents of this um, article, they themselves conceded that they did not know how um, the pairings were made. And I guess I have to say that, I guess I have a problem with that, that when there is a high profile paper out there and you read the methods section, I think there is an obligation that somebody else who thinks about these kinds of analyses, which I do, 
um, should have some idea of what you did. And if they don't have any idea of what you did, that itself is a problem. And then if you're queried about it and don't want to say, I mean, I don't know what to say. I think that's a big problem. Part two. Part two of this discussion is, I think all of this is really bad. This is a really big problem. So a day later, I came to this and said, we need to take even another step back. All of these research papers that seek to link immutable doctor characteristics, particularly those that have been the target of discrimination, such as race and gender and sexual orientation to patient outcomes, all of this research is a problem. It is a deep problem. It is a big problem. And let me explain. So here's the thing. Um, first, you know, I think I wanted to concede to the lay person that I understand why you think your health and your life is tied to your doctor. Of course, we all believe that. Um, you know, if I was getting operated on and the surgeon cut the wrong thing and my bled out, then of course I bet that that surgeon killed me. Um, however, too often in medicine, it is a team sport. There is not one person responsible for the care and it's very shaky proposition to attribute care to one person, particularly hospitalized people, particularly babies who are doing sick, who are getting sick, particularly people who are dying. There are more and more people that are brought in. You're getting the hematology consultant, you're getting the ICU consultant, you're getting all these people brought in when people are not doing well. The sicker they are, the more hands on deck. And who is driving the decisions? I think it's so easy to think there's some doctor out there just driving the ship. Often it's not the case, I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of people there and the ship is being driven by a few forces. One, there is a canon of how we take care of sick people and that canon is being carried out too there may be individual doctors pushing just a little bit to the left a little bit to the right here or there but it's a balancing act and there are a lot of people whose hands on that wheel there's not one person it's very difficult to attribute it to one person um i suspect also that the thing about biology that there is this idea out there that medicine is this omnipotent thing but the truth about effect size of everything we do in medicine is that they're very very small and it is very likely that for sick sick people and sick babies who are about to die, that the effect size of doing or not doing any of these interventions is really, really small. And the difference in doing that, attributing that to any one person is really, really small. And so to hypothesize that outcomes are being driven by having one or more white physicians on a team, um, when the effect of what they're doing is really, really small, um, and, and, there's so many people playing a role in those decisions, not just that one physician. I think that that's a very tough proposition to swallow for people who practice a lot of medicine. Um, I think at the outset, our, our, I would suspect that my my baseline null hypothesis is that it doesn't matter who any of these doctors are. It doesn't matter their race, their education, what they're doing. I think you're probably going to get very comparable care. It doesn't matter, really when you're really sick and be in the hospital. That's not to say that, of course, there's going to be one doctor out there who is, a, you know, a, a, a bad doctor and you have a bad outpatient encounter. But when we're talking about being really sick and going to the ICU, I find it very difficult to believe that there's one doctor doing any serious driving. The next point I wanted to make. Um, there are many of these papers that have looked at gender and looked at race, and they're, they're, they're just pouring out. Um, I think that... Um, it's, it's really hard to know who made the decision in an administrative data set. You know, even in criminal cases of malpractice where you review the charts and you comment, um, often you struggle with the idea of whether or not this doctor was culpable, even when you're looking at it with this sort of magnifying glass. When you're looking at an administrative data set with just billing codes, you don't really know who made the decisions. There may not be the people who billed for it. The doctor who suggested drug X to the ICU attending might not even be the ICU attending. The doctor who suggested stopping it might be a different person too. There are... A gap. There, there is a gap between who is being labeled as making decisions and who's making decisions in administrative data. Next. The next challenge with all these papers is that physician characteristics, particularly those that have been the target of discrimination, are also tied to the choice of specialty. There are different ratios of men and women in different specialties, which themselves is a product of bias. Um, there's also different rate, different rates of racial makeup in different specialties. There are different places of practice based on people by gender and by racial and ethnic groups. And there's differences in the population cared for. And these are all baked into where the patients are being seen. And many of these things are going to be very difficult to tease apart from who is doing the seeing, the doctor themselves, from where they're being seen and what the specialty is. Separating the doctor and the patient from the circumstances surrounding the place, timing, and details, and communities of their employment is a tall task. I do not think it can be done with administrative data. Docs who work in underserved communities may have limited resources and worse health outcomes through no fault of their own. 
third, the next thing that needs to be said um, in this thread is, of course, the analytic choices are vast and malleable. Brian Nozick gave the same data set to 20-some investigators, and he asked them, do black players get more red cards than white players in a soccer data set? And what he found was each of the teams, even when they had analytic plans and received feedback on their analytic plans, they still received a range of outcomes from equally likely to three times as likely. A huge range of outcomes were generated from the same data set with different people looking at the same question. Analytic flexibility here is massive and massive analytical flexibility allows for a range of possible outcomes. But for these kinds of questions, that is a big problem. And here's why it's a big problem. Because if you want to query whether or not a historically marginalized group, be it women, be it black Americans, be it any other group of people who have historically been marginalized, if you want to ask whether or not they have better, worse, or similar outcomes, you have a big challenge. You have massive analytical flexibility, but you have an extreme pressure on what the outcome can be. Because if you find it's better or the same, that is an outcome that we can get behind in 2020 America. If you find it is worse in whatever group you're looking at that has been historically disadvantaged, you have a big problem. One, that could easily be misinterpreted by lots of people. Two, it could be due to artifact. In fact, that's probably the most likely explanation. Even the benefit is probably most likely due to artifact. Um, Alternatively, it could represent discrimination from the patient side. If the patient's more likely to be non-compliant because they were discriminating against the doctor. You can't separate all these things. So put it all together, you have a very bad recipe. You have a proposition that's ill-defined, which is linking care to one doctor. You have massive analytical flexibility. You can generate a range of potential outcomes, and you have a strong disincentive to reach one particular result. So the net result is that the results you generate do not offer high credibility. They are much more likely to reflect the attitudes and opinions of those conducting the research than to be credible facts found in the data. Um, and, and finally, I really come to the fact that this is all well-meaning but misguided. Well-meaning because the people who are doing this research really want a true equality, but they're misguided because when you want something, you can never accept the terms of your opponent that are flawed. You cannot concede to your opponent what you do not want to concede. And we should not want to concede that in order to have black doctors or women doctors or any disadvantaged minority doctor, we need to justify they have better outcomes. We certainly don't want to concede that. That is not on the table. That is not germane to the discussion. Why do we need that? Because doctors should look like everybody else in the country. They should come from poor families because there's some people out there who are from poor families. They should be black. They should should be black. They should be women. They should be people of all different ethnicities. We need all their perspectives. This is a human this is a human craft we're practicing. We need the full richness and diversity of humanity, of different experiences, people who have a range of different experiences and a range of different even ideological positions. We need all that in medicine. Um, and so we need that for, for, for having its sake. We don't need that because it's instrumental in some greater outcome. And so I think that these studies, um, which they'll keep coming, and they're only going to be one direction if you hear about them, because if they are the other direction, I think there's going to be tremendous downward pressure in the publication system to quelch those findings um, and to rerun it. And because there's analytical flexibility, there will be a range of results. And so you will only get uh, one side of this. Um, many years ago in a Silomar, uh, and uh, at, at, in the time of the 1970s, there was a great fear about recombinant DNA technology. There's currently a fear about uh, gene editing of embryos. Um, these are powerful technologies that can be misused. Stata and, and sort of social questions is a powerful technology that can be misused um, by perverse actors. Um, they all require some regulation, some oversight. Um, this is no different. I think that's what we forget. And that's the point I wanted to make in my thread. And so I, I, you know, I tweeted this and I ended with an anonymous poll, which is who finds it problematic and who finds this work valuable. And it's 75% as of now with 300 votes, problematic. Part three. We need to be able to talk about this paper um, without being misrepresented or characterized or labeled of having malice. Um, You know, I did my very best in the tweet, in my final tweet, to say something like, you know, um, many people, and this is true, many, many people have emailed me, DM'd me, um, texted me, called me uh, to say very similar things about this paper, that they have great concerns about whether or not the methods can support the conclusions that are being massively amplified. Um, but that they were very unwilling to say anything. 
And, and they weren't all people who were of majority groups. They were other people who are from disadvantaged and minority groups, including some, some people from those groups as well. And they were very scared um, to, to comment. And so, you know, I, I tried very, very hard to um, be very cognizant of every single word I put into my tweets because I um, did not want there to be any potential to be misconstrued or caricaturized or, 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 or sort of taken in the wrong way. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I think, um, you know, this feeds into mob, mob Twitter and, and all this, which is that um, many of the people who are speaking in this space about this paper are in fact allies with the cause, the cause of justice and equality. Um, they are worried that they might have a minor misspeak. They might say something slightly wrong and um, be labeled as somebody who is not an ally, who is bad, who has a perverse or harmful agenda. And, and that is not good for those of us who seek progress. Because if we get all the people who we should be bringing in to our camp and making them fearful that we might push them out and exile them, um, we won't have the coalition we need to actually get substantive change. And so along this point, um, one of my friends called me this morning to say that um, based on the tweets that uh, I put out yesterday, uh, that somebody was talking about um, um, what they call white adjacent person of color. And this person thought that they were talking about me. Um, and I guess I would say that I'm not a, certainly not a white adjacent person of color as I am adjacent to anything else, I guess I am, in fact, a person of color. Uh, the color, of course, is brown. My parents are from India. Um, and uh, I certainly was called a whole bunch of names growing up and had a number of sort of experiences that make it very clear to me uh, that there are many people, even of my generation, who uh, do incorporate their impressions and prejudices against the color of your skin into how they interact with you. So I have no doubt that that is true. Um, but I'm certainly not white adjacent. I'm truth adjacent. I'm truth adjacent. That's what I'm about. What does that mean? I guess what I want to say is I care a lot that we are very, very accurate about what we do and we do things for the right reasons and articulate the absolute right reasons and that we don't promote things that are not true and not promotable. Um, in the discussion around this article, um, uh, Waleed Jalad has emailed the first author to clarify how the MD was paired. Um, that email has not been answered yet. There were some threads that tagged the second author um, who, instead of answering how the pairing was done to provide us some clarity, um, just wrote something like hashtag distraction um, and, and suggested that perhaps our, our motive was, was Ill, Ill motivated. Um, it's, it's no such thing. I mean, those of us who have raised methodologic questions on this paper are, uh, the deepest of allies on this space, in this space. Um, we're all allied on the cause. Um, but we also think it's very important that these kinds of claims are really, really strong to do this study really, really strong. I think you need to show, um, one, that um, black physicians and white physicians are getting roughly the same types of patients. Two, that there is in fact a doctor who drives the care. Three, that that a doctor who drives the care actually does different things for different babies um, who are otherwise similar with the only difference being race. And that those things that they're doing differently have differences in outcomes that have been quantified and that the magnitude of those differences translate into outcome differences that are all plausible. That is a very tall order. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that that's true. I don't think that you would find um, in really robust analyses that doctors are discriminating against the patients. Um, this analysis would looked at black and white um, doctors and they were cataloged by looking at their photo and their last name and making a judgment. I, I don't like that personally, but there were also Indians and different categories that they put people in. Um, they should give us the data for all those categories because that might reveal some of the other potential ways in which there is bias in this data set. Another argument somebody made was that all of the problems with this data set would bias it toward, towards the null, finding um, no difference when, when 
the difference in fact exists. And I would say that that is a huge assumption um, that cannot be uh, made unless one really knows how the pairings are being made. And and inequalities in the rate with which different races pursue different specialties, in fact, could be a major potential bias. And also um, the rates at which wealthier patients do have some control and agency over their doctors could also be a potential bias. I think that those could be systematic and drive the entire outcome. I, I honestly think that knowing what I know about the effect sizes of interventions, particularly those who are critically ill, knowing what I know about the way in which medicine is practice and team medicine, I think that the results prima facie are not plausible. Um, and that almost surely what the authors have done is find um, analytic noise, and that's being massively amplified, um, which create a really sort of powerful and um, a powerful narrative um, that I'm not so sure is a narrative um, that that is helpful to the cause of justice and equality, or a narrative that doesn't help as much as we might wish it helped. Um, I think there is a problem with the way in which some of this feedback has been greeted in terms of if the authors don't want to give or provide any additional information. I think that that's a little troublesome to me because um, we are engaged in something that is, to many of us, akin to sort of a religion in our lives. It defines so much of how we view the world and, and navigate the world, and that is science. And um, and in order to participate in science, I think you have to make a good faith effort to providing those who may not see your analysis the same way with enough information that they can try to explain why you might find something when something does not exist. Um, anyway, I think the thing I wanted to talk about in this third part was that we really have to be careful about having an academy where people feel comfortable with saying what I said um, about this paper without the response being that they are a white adjacent person of color, that they are doing this because of their racial background. I think we have to be strive very hard to let people criticize things, even if you don't want to hear it. Um, I myself have been the subject of pretty harsh criticism, and I know that when one of your papers gets amplified massively, oh, people will come for you. And I know that not all that criticism is sound. I know some criticism is sound, and I know not all of it's sound. And I know that some of it is ill-motivated, and not all of it is ill-motivated. But, you know, my view is not to err on the side of assuming the worst about people who are raising methodologic questions. I think you have to err on the side of assuming the best. Um, particularly when in this case, I don't know any of these authors and have never, I don't think ever commented about any of their work um, because I don't follow it and I don't know it. And also because I'm somebody who uh, more than anything, I like to comment about methodology that does not yield stated results. That's my thing. Uh, and this is in fact falling within my thing category. And and I've also, we've written letters to the editor about a paper many years ago about uh, gender differences in hospital outcomes. You can go back and pull that. I mean, we've been very interested in the attribution to specific physicians of patient outcomes when there are many physicians whose hand is on the steering wheel. So this is um, of, of concern to me that an academy that should be willing to hear things in a very broad sense has a lot of people who are reluctant to say things because they're worried about how they will be treated on Twitter. That is not a good place to be. And I don't have the answer, but I think it's a palpable, a palpable feeling that we have. And the last thing I'd say on this topic is um, the time that has been spent on trying to figure out um, whether or not this effect is real or not uh, could be better spent on trying to figure out the best ways to have the diverse workforce that we actually want to have. And I don't have all the answers there, um, but I suspect that that's going to take a lot of work and it's going to um, take work that happens long before one submits an application to medical school, work that goes to um, people who are as early as um, ninth and 10th graders um, who are um, thinking about a medical career uh, or who don't even know to think about a medical career or maybe even earlier than that um, to, to try to reach kids and, uh, and guide them 
uh, at least not towards medicine, like they have to do medicine, but at least to put medicine on their radar. Um, and, and I think it would be much more fruitful to spend the time in that direction than many more papers that seek to claim um, that there are these survival differences based on immutable physician characteristics. Um, and I think it's an uphill battle to actually to do that correctly. So on that positive note, we're going to turn to the HERO trial. All right, I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom by Dr. Michael Burns. Michael Burns is a physician scientist who's completing his hematology oncology fellowship training at Northwestern University. He's an MD PhD from Vanderbilt, and his interest is GU oncology. And he's here to talk about the randomized control trial, HERO, which is oral relagolics for androgen deprivation therapy in advanced prostate cancer. This is the HERO study, an oral GNRH antagonist. You don't want to miss this discussion. Michael, it's great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for suggesting this article. So you're one of the people who has taken my suggestion. I encourage more listeners of Plenary Session, take my suggestion and and bring an article. And this is such a gem of an article. So thank you so much, Michael, for picking this article. Great. Yeah, it's uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, recently, and it was also an ASCO virtual meeting presentation. So I thought it was very relevant to what we're going to be seeing in the future of our clinical practice. Yes, it will. It's a, it is a, practice impacting study. And we're going to decide on this episode, which way that impact goes. So why don't you take us through it? Take us through a little bit of this study. Um, You know, I'll just, I'll let you tell listeners what you think they need to know about this space and then take us through it. Okay. How about start with a little background? Yeah, it's always good. Okay. So the background of this study is that it's going to compare to LHRH agonists. And we'll kind of discuss those a little bit, but um, basically, they're a, a cornerstone of our treatment for prostate cancer. Um, we often use them as an injection. They have a slow onset and eventually result in suppression of the testosterone levels. Um, so prostate cancer is a disease that is driven by uh, male hormones or androgens, mm-hmm. and uh, reducing that uh, slows the progression of disease. Um, and this is going to compare that LHRH agonist to a new oral GnRH antagonist that will rapidly reduce testosterone levels. Then it's, it's got the uh, advantages of being a pill with a quick on, quick off. Okay. So those are the, the two comparators that we're going to look at here. I think that was well put. Um, you know, prostate cancer is such an interesting cancer, of course. Uh, back in like the 1920s and 30s, Charles Huggins identified that it was driven by testosterone. And... Um, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize, I believe, what, 1940-ish. Uh, the treatment for that is simple. It's surgical orchiectomy. You can remove the testes and you'll get less testosterone. Um, but for a number of reasons, largely psychological um, reasons, uh, that is not the preferred option in this country. And so we use our knowledge of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which you're about to talk about, um, to, to do the same thing. And so why don't you take us through, you know, what are the chemical ways we can achieve um, the removal or deprivation of testosterone in the body? All right. So to understand testosterone or androgen deprivation therapy, you have to have an understanding of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Our favorite thing. So a GnRH uh, from the hypothalamus then st- stimulates LH and FSH secretion from the pituitary. That is a hormone. It's going to go to the testes. You're then going to get an increase in testosterone level, primarily from the testes, uh, which is why we talk about surgical orchiectomies. Um, but you'll also get a small amount of intracellular conversion of testosterone in the adrenal glands. Um, once you have testosterone, testosterone must be bound. It's a small molecule. Um, so small molecules to have action must be bound. In this case, it binds the androgen receptor. Uh, once bound by the androgen receptor, causes transcription, uh, growth, proliferation, bad things in cancer. Yeah, and you have uh, a really nice figure up here where you basically show the axis, and you point, I think it really shows, makes it really clear that, you know, the majority of the drugs we use in prostate cancer impact this axis. Lupron hits it as a GnRH agonist, Degarelix hits it, um, uh, Abiraterone hits it at the CYP17 level. Uh, enzalutamide, bicalutamide, uh, uh, they hit it at the androgen receptor level, but pretty much the majority of the drugs in this space hit this pathway. Fair to say? Correct. I mean, the uh, androgen axis is a cornerstone of our therapy 
for pretty much every setting of prostate cancer treatment. Um, at least every, every advanced setting, I should say. Yeah, except uh, docetaxel. Although some people believe that some of the taxanes work through androgen receptor trafficking in the cell. So, you know, there's there's a couple of stories for taxanes. But I guess the one that doesn't work this way is a dendrion sipilucyl T. And that's because it probably doesn't work at all. So, all right, I'll let you go on. Yeah. Um, I guess the big concern about anything in this pathway, um, both testosterone and the medications that we use to inhibit this pathway, um, are cardiovascular uh, events, so strokes and MIs and death from that. Uh, most patients with prostate cancer will actually end up dying, I guess 30% of patients with prostate cancer will actually end up dying from a cardiac event, mm -hmm. uh, not just their disease. And so this is becoming a more important thing that we consider with all of these medications because part of their adverse event profile can put you at increased at risk for cardiovascular events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so the two cornerstones of therapy that we have are LHRH agonists and antagonists. Um, and it's going to be kind of difficult to hear over a podcast, but one of them increases uh, signaling in this pathway. Uh, you can think of it like turning electricity up until your light switch or your, your light bulb burns out and yeah. then it goes up. Good. Okay. Good, so yeah. good analogy. Um, eventually you'll get desensitization and then testosterone levels go down. But first it's going up, okay? Testosterone goes up first. This is the uh, LHRH agonist. It flogs it until it exhausts itself, yes. Lupron, Lupron, exactly. yes, okay. FH, LH first go up, testosterone first goes up, and then goes down. Yes. Okay, and that happens over a period of days to weeks. Um, LHRH antagonists do the opposite. Turn the switch off, everything goes down. Yes. Very simple. Um, so the agonists are Lupron, the antagonists are Degarelix, the injectable, and then this new drug, right. Relogulix. Relogulix. Right. Relogulix. Relogulix. God damn. Well, I, I'm not going to need to pronounce it when you're done with this paper. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Relogulix. Yeah, so Relogulix. Okay. an oral antagonist, quick on, everything drops, quick off. If you wanted to, things could come back up. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, okay. Go on. You've got this laid out well. And so they're going to test it against uh, Lupron. So it's, this is a multinational phase three study. It's open label. It's randomized in a two to one fashion um, to either Relagolex, 30 milligrams loading dose, followed by 120 milligrams daily, mm. or Lupron every three months, which is the standard here. Um, this is a multinational study, so the, the dosing in Japan and Taiwan are, is a little bit lower. It's 11.25 milligrams versus the standard 22.5 um, here that we're more familiar with using. I see. So it's a two-to-one randomization of me taking a pill every day that's going to suppress my testosterone or me getting an injection once every three months at a, lower, at a lower price that will have a brief flare of testosterone but then suppress my testosterone. Right. And okay. it doesn't include, so it doesn't include the other agents we have in this pathway. So, um, Degarelix, uh, once a month injection, not included in this study. It's not a control arm. I see. Obviously right. not because you wouldn't want to compare a GNRH antagonist. That's a pill against a GNRH antagonist. That is a shot. You want to compare a GNRH antagonist against an LHRH agonist. That's what you want to do. Okay. That's what we're doing. Here. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Okay. Uh, primary endpoint is sustained castration day 29 through week 48. Okay. Um, castration being defined as a testosterone level less than 50 nanograms per deciliter. I see. Okay, so that is a conventional way in which we define uh, testosterone suppression in prostate cancer. Um, but what you're saying is that the endpoint of this study, you know, the endpoints I'm familiar with, when I see prostate cancer patients, they care about, um, you know, uh, living longer, skeletal mets, new metastases in bad spots, pain, discomfort. Um, I'm not, I didn't even meet many of them who come in and tell me they care about when their testosterone drops below 50 nanograms per deciliter. But, you know, maybe I haven't talked to enough people. Who knows? <laughs> All right. I mean, um, living longer, feeling better. Um, you didn't mention PSA. I guess people it, care about PSA, but in part because we've taught them to care about PSA. 
Right. But even PSA changes, we get a lot of changes in PSA in the clinic. Yeah. Um, and then we have to say, how relevant is that? Of course. And then go look at the imaging or decide, are you also having symptoms with that? Yeah. Okay. And, and sometimes you, you, um, you, you, are often in a situation where you don't want to make a decision based on one PSA. Sometimes you want to bring somebody back and get another PSA. Get a couple more data points with a with a volatile thing like PSA, um, uh, with something that has a little bit of ebb and flow to it. Um, yeah, I agree with you absolutely. And you want to get clinical correlates as much as you can, radiographic correlates and symptom correlates. Right, right. I mean, we we know we only have so many tools in our toolbox, and so we want to get the most out of them and make sure that our data is accurate. Okay, that's well put. So here you have multinational phase three randomized control trial, Relugalix versus Lupron. Okay, you tell us the primary endpoints. So, all right, go on. Uh, we have some key, we have secondary endpoints. We have a lot of secondary endpoints. We have key secondary endpoints and then other secondary endpoints as well. So some of the key secondary endpoints, I'm going to direct people to the paper in the appendix as well if they want to look at everything. But some of the key secondary endpoints, I'll just go through real quickly for you. Castrate levels on day four. Mm -hmm. Castrate levels on day 15. Mm -hmm. PSA response by day 15. That's going to be confirmed on day 29. Um, profound testosterone suppression to less than 20 nanograms per deciliter on day 15. And then FSH levels uh, on week 24. Let me ask you, how many times have you been in clinic and the patient's there and they're getting their Lupron shot and you say, you know what, after this Lupron shot, we're going to bring you back four days from now just to make sure you're castrate. We're going to bring you back in two weeks, make sure you're castrate, of course. We're going to check a PSA in two weeks when you are proven to be castrate and we are going to check your FSH. How often do you do that in your clinical practice? I, I have not done this yet. <laughs> yeah, never. The answer is never, because none of these things are relevant to any single human being nor the practice of medicine, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, in fact, um, and I, to be honest, would you be very optimistic that the castrate level on day four of Lupron is going to be good? Uh, Lupron is going to take a while to work. We know yeah, this. We know this. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fair point. We, these were, we kind of knew what was going to happen with each one of these. That's all great studies is when you know the result before you even enroll the first patient. That's the mark of a hallmark of a great scientific study. Okay. So th that's, I mean, those are good to point out that these are secondary endpoints. Let's take, there's more secondary endpoints. Let's take us through there's those. More. Yeah. So, um, so other endpoints that they're going to look at are our time to testosterone recovery. So certain patients, and then we'll go through each, each um, group within this trial, but certain patients won't need a uh, lifelong ADT. Uh, so time to testosterone recovery. Uh, time to PSA progression uh, per prostate cancer working group three, um, which is something that we often do use in clinical trials sure. um, for prostate cancer patients. Um, prostate or PSA levels at week 25, sustained castration resistant or suppression week 25 through week 48. So kind of like the late time points of this sure. uh, study of the year long, the second half of the year, where you, was your testosterone low? And then quality of life endpoints, um, patient reported health outcomes. Okay, terrific. Okay, you've taken us through the endpoints. You took us through the primary endpoint, which of course is the gold standard endpoint in prostate cancer, the one you and I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, which is, is the testosterone lower than 50 nanograms per deciliter? Um, actually, uh, that's the primary endpoint. But this is an interesting study because it is not designed primarily to show the superiority of testosterone suppression, it's a non-inferiority study. So can you take us through that statistical analysis plan? Right. So it's a non-inferiority study comparing um, Relagolix to Luprolide uh, with, with, with uh, respect to sustained castration rate, uh, a non-inferiority margin of negative 10 percentage points, or less than 10 percentage points, I should say. Yes. Which is interesting because we're going to get into, but Lupron and Degarelix work exquisitely well. When you talk about three months into Lupron and three months into Degarelix, one, you know the patient got it. Because if the patient is in your office, they're going to get it because they're going to get it. You know, you have total control over them receiving it. And once you give it to them, after you give it to them, after the initial flare of Lupron is over, and you don't get that with Degarelix, um, you know they're going to be testosterone suppressed. This study is interesting because it's looking at day 29 to 48 weeks. 
That might be the tail of the flare in Lupron. And it's looking to see is Rugel... Rel- Relugalix, and I'm not going to correct that in my audio editing. Relugalix. I want people to know that I'm mispronouncing this because when I make my verdict on it, they'll know that I never need to learn the pronunciation. So Relugalix, um, they want to show that it's non-inferior. And that's kind of a generous margin. You said 10% margin? Right. So if you have like a 98% suppression on Lupron, you're willing to accept up to an 88%. You're you're willing to allow the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval to be above 88% um, for Relugalix. Uh, that's a hefty margin. That's a margin that's so large you can park a school bus in. That's the parallel parking spot you can fit. You know, that's the margin that, you know, I'm non-inferior, good-looking to Brad Pitt when you pick a big-ass margin like that. And that's a big margin. And that's what they've chosen. They've powered this study with tons of power for a huge margin in, for an endpoint that makes no sense, um, which is an endpoint that we know is met with Lupron and we know is met with Daguerrelic. So I think that's worth noting, and we're going to come back to that. So take us through who's eligible for this study and who they enroll and what they find, and then let's let's talk about it. Sure. So key eligibility criteria um, puts you into one of three states with advanced prostate cancer. Either you had um, what was intended to be definitive management. Um, so surgery or radiation therapy, and then you had biochemical relapse after. And we should acknowledge that that is a common scenario that maybe 40% of people who are treated quote unquote definitively do have biochemical relapse at some point. Right. It does happen. Um, and that's a a large portion of patients that we see when the PSA starts to rise, um, after radiotherapy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, metastatic disease. So new onset metastatic disease. And then advanced disease, advanced localized disease, so that you were not um, a candidate for definitive there. Yeah, you're not, okay. you're, they, they don't think they'll cure you. Okay. Right. Um, you had to be, this is at the practitioner's discretion, but you had to require at least one year of androgen deprivation therapy. Okay. Um, you had to have a measurable serum, testosterone, and PSA. So over 150 nanograms per deciliter and a PSA over two. And then you had to have an excellent performance status. Of course. As God intended. Okay. Um, Exclusion criteria. uh, Some, I'm not going to point out them all because there's a list of 18, uh, but some of them that I will focus on um, are chemotherapy or surgical therapy expected within two months of initiating androgen deprivation therapy. Um, And so this happens for some of the castrate sensitive patients who have high volume disease, certainly perhaps docetaxel and perhaps even some of them we can dispute a little bit, but perhaps even some of them with low volume disease and thinking about abiraterone or something like that. Right. I mean, we can waffle over the term high volume uh, and how we're defining that one way or another for what agent you're going to be getting for combination therapy, which is the standard of care in the setting for metastatic disease. Um, But certainly if you thought that they were going to need chemotherapy, I would say that's kind of indicating you think they're high volume. Yeah. Okay. Right. Of course. That's well put. Yeah. So we're excluding people with high volume disease um, per stampede guidelines. Um, okay. This is good. And and then let's talk about the cardiovascular. We're excluding people with cardiovascular risk. Right. So cardiovascular, actually major adverse cardiovascular event within the past six months. So heart attack, stroke within the past six months, um, arrhythmias or uncontrolled hypertension, which actually, if you look at the, def- the definition of that, I think it was systolic of 160. Yeah. And then a diastolic of 100. Okay. So depending on the patient population you're seeing, you could easily not meet that criteria. You could be seen, get your hypertension under control, and then be reevaluated for this type of. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, these agents have cardiovascular risks, and that might play a role in your thinking when you're talking about um, the biochemically recurrent setting, um, if they have severe cardiovascular risk. But if they have real metastatic disease, I think many of us are going to do the best we can and androgen suppress them because rip roaring prostate cancer is not a great thing to have going on either. So, okay. That's, that's good to note. Um, take us to the next, uh, your next slide. Yeah. I'll come back to that. Okay. Some of the medications that were prohibited. Oh yeah. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want to jump in there, no, we no, can no. go on, go, you put it where you want it. Yeah. Uh, this is who they enrolled. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into who they enrolled within the trial. I mean, yeah. median age is about 72, which okay. is pretty much what we're seeing in the clinic. Yeah, that's uh, true. Most, 
most of the patients were from North America and Europe. About uh, a quarter of patients were from the Asia Pacific region. I only bring that up because of the dosing for Lupron. It's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the types of patients they evolved in, in terms of where their disease was or, or what group they fit into, about a quarter of these patients were newly diagnosed androgen sensitive metastatic disease mm -hmm. in both arms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, half of the patients were biochemical recurrence. Um, and then the, the other quarter of patients were advanced localized disease. Mm -hmm. um, everyone had a good performance status except for one patient, which they describe in the paper. And then um, a, a key Protocol thing that I want to point out yeah. is who has cardiovascular risk factors. So if you think about the lifestyle risk factors, you're going to talk about smoking, drinking, and a BMI over 30. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of patients in this study did have this. So any risk factors, over 90% in both arms. Um, besides lifestyle risk factors, uh, they also looked at things like hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, history of MI. Uh, and then they, they also classified patients with um, a history of a major cardiac event. Mm -hmm. uh, being defined as stroke or MI. Okay. And so 14% of patients in each arm hadn't fit that criteria, which is actually a little low compared to what we're seeing in the general population. We're usually seeing around 30%. Uh, that changes a little bit depending on where you practice, whether you're practicing um, in different parts of the country or a setting like a VA or um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Yeah. You are allowed to enroll with the history of MACE but that MACE certainly was not allowed to have affected your ECOG because then you'd be booted off the study. Um, uh, you wouldn't be enrolled on the study because of the ECOG requirement. Um, but, you know, this is the typical picture. I mean, 72-year-old men have cardiovascular risk factors, for, for better or worse. Absolutely. I mean, it, it may be a little healthier than what we're seeing in the, in the yeah. clinic. But, uh, this is the groups that we're worried about. We are worried about patients with prostate cancer uh, having cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Okay, this is good. Now, uh, let's jump back to the medicines that are prohibited on study. Okay. Um, it's kind of the ones that you already know. So, can't get a GnRH antagonist. Um, the Garalex is off, so no Firmagon. Um, Antiandrogens, uh, there's a little asterisk here. So, antiandrogens are allowed. So, you can use an antiandrogen to prevent flare. Um, and that can be bicalutamide or any... Uh, other antiandrogen that you would like. Uh, enzalutamide was only allowed if um, you progress to castration resistance on the study. Yeah, okay. Wow. Um, so abiraterone was not allowed. Um, and then other things that we can use to suppress androgens, uh, ketoconazole and estrogens were not allowed as well. Uh, the only other point that I would make um, from this table um, not just looking at what we treat prostate cancer with, but uh, an important thing is to consider what medications are not allowed that are important for cardiovascular outcomes. Um, amiodarone, captopril, uh, diltiazam, tacagrelor. Uh, there's a pretty substantial list here. I see. And the irony is that... Um you know, they're, they're claiming that you can't take those because of P glycoprotein interactions. But the reality is what that's going to do is further deplete the population of people with sort of age, typical cardiovascular comorbidities, because they might be on some of those things, verapamil or DILT or captopril or ticagrelor, they might be on that. And then if you have this prohibition, they're going to get pushed out of the study. And so that might be why these people are at sort of lower cardiovascular risk than as you feel the population you see in your clinic. I think one thing that's really interesting to me is let's talk a little bit about the flare. Um, you know, many of us, when we do start Lupron, we consider, should this patient get a month, two months of bicalutamide? But who right. are the people we consider that in? It's not the biochemically recurrent people. We're not too worried that if they had a transient elevation in testosterone, prostate cancer is going to grow and cause problems because they're only biochemically recurrent. It's typically the people who've got mets in places that we don't want them to grow even a little bit before they shrink. And those right. places typically are spinal cord, um, perhaps visceral organs, um, perhaps if they have a lot of disease. But there might already be some, 
some of the inclusion criteria may have tacitly selected against those people because they might be stampede players, high volume players, and they're not going to be eligible because of chemo. So the interesting thing about their design is even though they don't prohibit bicalutamide, they're basically getting a group of people in whom the doctors will probably not be giving bicalutamide, thus guaranteeing there will be a testosterone flare. And then if their primary endpoint can capture some of that flare, well, then it's a winner winner for them. Well, there, there is going to be testosterone flare even in the setting where you can use bicalutamide. That's a good point too. Yeah, right. Uh, so the, the T will go up. The T will go up. It's the AR that we block. Right. Of course, it's downstream. It, it yeah. Down, so yeah. It, it won't have an effect. Yes. Uh, so then clinical flare uh, are those things you're talking about. Do you have a metastasis somewhere where it's going to put you at risk for cord compression? Yes. Okay. Do you have a metastasis in a, in a visceral organ where where you think that patient needs testosterone to drop quickly. Yes. And you also think that that patient's going to need chemo. Yes. Um, so charted criteria for docetaxel. Yes. Uh, um, you, you know, the other thing for, for flare, um, urinary obstruction. Yes, that's a good point for flare. Oh, but you're absolutely right, though. You know, because bicalutamide is not going to stop the testosterone. Testosterone is going to, testosterone is going to go up with a GnRH agonist no matter what it's going to go up right even if you give the bical it blocks it it blocks the air receptor downstream sorry so i i misspoke there yeah so i mean this essentially is going to compare a drug without a flare to a drug with a flare and then the primary endpoint is going to capture the tail of the flare because it starts at 29 days right but you can you can block antiandrogen flare or at least clinically um, you were allowed to yes you're allowed to right i see i don't know well i haven't gone through the results yet but i'm going to tell you we don't know who got a anti-androgen or androgen receptor antagonist. I see. So let's jump to results. Let's not keep the listeners in suspense any longer. Yeah. Okay. We'll jump straight to the results. Uh, why not? That's uh, primary endpoint. Yeah. Uh, primary endpoint sustained testosterone suppression below castrate levels. So 50 nanograms per deciliter from day 29 all the way through 48 weeks, uh, achieved in 96.7% of the relagolix arm compared to 88.8% of the Lupron arm. Wow. So does that meet the non-inferiority threshold? It meets the non-inferiority inferiority threshold. Um, and in, a different, in addition to that, the lower boundary uh, of the confidence interval was above zero, so it actually met the superiority threshold. Oh, my God. Amazing. They have proven that an oral GNRH antagonist has a superior rate of T suppression from days 29 to week 48 compared to a GNRH agonist like Lupron. Well, well, well done. Well done, Rugerolix. Rulugolix. Relagolix. Well done. So this is interesting. Um, do you want to... I want to look at the figure in the paper that you sent me. Let's no, talk. this is it. Yeah, I think... Uh... From, for testosterone suppression, for those time points, predictably did win for that the whole time. But then you have to say, it, it's not, this is from day 29 through 48 weeks. Yes. When did people fail? Okay. So when did their testosterone become above 50 nanograms? Correct. Uh, per deciliter. And, you know, a point that I'm, I'm not going to jump to yet, but what happened from that is also a relevant question that we should be asking. Okay. And so in the appendix, what we can look at is their actual Kaplan-Meier analysis. Yes. Um, looking at patients that either had a testosterone above 50 nanograms per deciliter um, and when that occurred. So if you look at the Lupron arm alone, um, at day 29, which is week five, day one, uh, what you can see is that uh, a, a substantial number of patients decreased or did not meet that criteria, did not have a testosterone that was uh, less than 50 nanograms per deciliter. So everyone's dropping early um, yes. and not meeting criteria for this endpoint. Um, so, and then the later ends of the curve, so the later ends of uh, the year, of weeks 25 through 49 or 48, um, it was pretty stable. And so yeah. it's really the early time points where uh, this advantage is coming in on. Right. So in other words, that the superiority of their pill over the shot is entirely driven by what happens early on. And then the other figure I want to draw your attention to is figure 1B of the paper. Pull, uh, take a look at that. You might not have a slide, but take a look at it. 
right there. Yeah. So look at that. Um, you see very clearly, this is the testosterone level by arm week by week. At the baseline, they're the same. Okay, good. It's randomized. Um, Relugalix goes down right away. By week one, it's very, very low. Week two, week three, blah, blah, blah. Um, Lupron goes up by week one to two. It's up a little bit. It's up to 600 mil nanograms per deciliter. But then by week three, um, it's dropping. By week five, they're almost indistinguishable. And they're indistinguishable then for the rest of the time until week 48. They're indistinguishable in my, in my eye. Um, because the primary endpoint captures day 29, but that between week four or five, there's going to be a difference between the two arms, and it's going to be entirely driven by the few people who still have T-flare after getting Lupron, uh, a fraction of people. The entire benefit of this drug is that it doesn't have the flare. Um, it's not that it has a, lo a better rate of T-suppression in week 41. In week 41, they do the same. Right. I think so, yeah. Um, and that, that benefit that you refer to is in terms of testosterone level. Right. Change. A f uh, uh, an end point that is not a measure of what matters at a time point that certainly doesn't matter for a drug that is going to be, that is better than something that's going to achieve the same goal later. Okay, why don't we, um, I don't know, I guess it's, um, it's, it's too tempting to just say everything. So maybe I'll let you say, you know, I guess... What do you think? I mean, what are your concerns with this study? Tell tell the listener. Tell, uh, tell them the truth. <laughs> tell them the truth. What do you what do you think about this drug? What do you think about this study? Uh, I think the the big concerns that I have are yeah. the the win that they have from from a statistical significance. Uh, I have no doubt that they won that early on. Um, but whether or not you dropping the testosterone that fast is going to have a long-term difference in a clinical outcome that's going to matter for our patients is something that um, really we didn't get a lot of data from yeah. in this article. Um, so did patients have clinical flare? What was their time till PSA progression? Right. Uh, is this going to help overall survival? Is this going to help, you know, um, patients feel better? I mean, it's a pill, right? So one of the advantages theoretically is that you don't have to get a shot. You're not going to have an injection site reaction like you will from uh, the Garelex. And so are people actually feeling better, have a better quality of life from this? And that's also not reported here. Yeah, I think that's, you know, tr I mean, that's, that's well put. I guess, I mean, I agree with, with everything you're saying. Like the primary endpoint is a surrogate of a surrogate. I mean, PSA is the surrogate. This is a surrogate of the surrogate. It's the pre-surrogate. It's a double surrogate. I mean, it's a real, quite a surrogate endpoint. It's an interesting surrogate because it's a surrogate that, you know, I don't really even measure in my clinical practice. Certainly not at these time points. You know, it's not routinely measured. PSA, at least at some point, time points is measured. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that the difference between Lupron and this drug on testosterone very early, but not late, is never, ever, ever going to have any difference on any clinical endpoint that ever, ever affects a patient. I just don't think it's possible that it could. Because if it would, if it did, Degarelix would have demonstrated those benefits over Lupron, and Degarelix never has to date. I mean, that's, that's my argument. Um, the next thing I think is the pill aspect. Let's talk about that. I mean, I think there are many settings in oncology where a pill is convenient, Getting a pill is much more convenient than getting sub-Q enoxaparin, you know, for your PE, for your DVT. Taking uh, rivaroxaban, so much more convenient than sticking yourself in the belly every day. But this isn't sticking yourself in the belly every day. This is getting a shot every three months. Three months to see the doctor. You're going to be there anyway to see the doctor. I actually think it's more convenient to get the depo shot. You know, the irony is with like Risperdal and things like that, they're trying to make it depo injection. Here, they're trying to make it a pill. Um, I think it's a, this is a depo injection. It's actually more convenient. It's like getting a birth control depo shot. Um, it lasts for months. And the other thing I was thinking is that I bet in the real world, when you don't have these carefully curated patients, but you get average people, average Joes, literally patients in your clinic, I bet Lupron may even be superior because 
who takes a pill every day? I mean, we all forget. I mean, we, you know, and that if you forget on this drug, we can talk about in a second, but it's not going to take that long for your tea to creep back. It doesn't have long lasting effects. If you forget a few days, a week, um, your tea is going to be back real quick. And that is probably not terrific. In fact, we know that's not terrific from the intermittent continuous studies. We know that's not terrific in metastatic prostate cancer settings. So I actually think the irony is in the real world setting, this would be inferior because people were not going to take a pill, but they will be getting their depo shot when they have to come in um you're about to say something no no, i think i think it's totally fair um the i was just uh gonna say that patients did have a really really good adherence in this trial yeah too good Um, i mean it's amazing uh that's that's one of the things i was gonna say is it's probably not representative of what i'm seeing every day in the clinic um and i think most of the patients would or most of people would say that it's hard to take a pill. Certainly, you could say that it may be possible for patients that need a, um, a limited duration uh, yes. of antigen deprivation therapy. But for those patients that are going to need to take a pill lifelong, that's a whole other question that we that we need to be saying, is this a real big advantage for? Or, yeah. is, it, or is it a disadvantage? Yeah, I, I yeah. I'll answer it. It's a, dis- it's, a dis- it's a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage to take a depo shot and turn it into a pill. It's an advantage yeah. to take a daily shot and turn it into a pill. I mean, that's what I think the authors are missing. They're going to bamboozle in CME events, the audience, with this idea that it's an advantage. It's not an advantage. I would much rather get a once every three month shot for a- if I had to take anything than to take a pill every day, especially a pill that's not fun to take. They have more diarrhea. I think they had twice the rate of diarrhea. You know, what was it? 12% diarrhea, something like that. 5% versus 6%. Yeah, so it doubles your diarrhea. You're taking a pill. This is not a pill that, um, you know, it doesn't give you a boost of energy. It's not like when I take my, um, you know, my vitamin D pill. No, I don't take that. But, you know, it's not like a pill that gives you a boost. In fact, it's a pill that... It's going to take away your testosterone, which makes you feel crummy. And if you give that cho- give, put that in the hands of the patient, the temptation to discontinue in the real world is going to be massive. It gives you diarrhea and it takes away testosterone, which is a huge driver of who we are, our personalities and all that stuff. I mean, and you know how we feel. We, you know, um, Lupron for, is something that you don't have control over on a day-to-day basis, but you're doing what is arguably right for you in the long term in many settings where there's survival benefits um, of androgen deprivation. Um, okay. So I think the oral aspect is a disadvantage. I think I want to talk a little bit about the Daguerrelix comparator. Um, why didn't they compare this? Pi- and, and, we, and we have to get back to cardiovascular outcomes. Okay. At some point. Let's come back to that. That'll be the last thing. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing that you'll have to say to, to teach me more about. It. Okay. So do you think this should have been a randomized trial against Daguerrelix? Uh, yeah, I do. I think, and it may still be coming. Um, but yes, is the short answer. Yeah. And, and I guess because, I mean, it's clearly an engineered trial to get a result because they're going to count on that, um, T flare of Lupron and that's what's going to drive the superiority. If they went against Daguerrelix, there's going to be no flare. So there will be no superiority. I'm confident. But I also think, this is what we were talking about before we started, I think they would, it would be very difficult for them to show non-inferiority as well. If you have a treatment that has a a 100% T suppression rate, um, how can you be non-inferior to that? You need events to power a trial for non-inferiority. You need some event rate. If the event rate is zero, I need we need some statisticians to comment. But if an event rate of an intervention is zero, what? how do you do your sample size calculation for non-inferiority? I think it's a challenge. And I think that, I think it, I, I don't know if they could even prove themselves non-inferior to Daguerrelix, a, a drug that works super well. And, and they tiptoe around the reason. The reason we don't give Daguerrelix is not because it's a shot and it's not because of the infect, it's not because of the site reaction, which occurs rarely. Um, it's because it's expensive. And that's what their pill is going to be too, expensive. And the reason we give Lupron is it's cheap. And that's why we give Lupron. And your expensive pill is not any cheaper than Lupron. So I'm never going to give it. It's a ridiculous thing. Right. I mean, financial toxicity is real in these patients. Um, the Garelex is very expensive. Lupron is not cheap either, and neither is the way that we're administering it. If you think they, they have to come into the clinic, they have to get an injection in the clinic. Um, and so there's a lot of cost associated with each of those. And that's why some people um, are still considering um, orchiectomy um, yeah. and castration with uh, some of the new um, orchiectomies 
leaving some tissue behind with a subcapsular approach oh, mm-hmm. can uh, make you not have that uh, empty scrotum uh, sensation that so many patients find uh, discomforting. Because, yeah. yeah. But I've also seen some of the um, prosthetic implants and that can, and I've seen some people happy with those if they did go the orchiectomy route. Um, yeah. But, yeah. These discussions that we have in clinic, they're not easy discussions. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine, um, pill versus shot discussions are much easier than a discussion like that. Right. Um, but when we're talking long-term financial toxicities, that, that could be something more relevant to be, to be bringing up, especially today. And right. especially in other countries. Yes. Let's talk about the cardiovascular events. They make a uh, big claims, big, bold claims. But, uh, what do you think about that? Um, I think this is the information that, that we want to know. Um, so I do applaud them actually, uh, putting this in as endpoints or, you know, I think this should set a standard for some of the, the, the trials that we have going forward, because this is something that we're concerned about in the clinic. So we should be measuring it mm-hmm. flat out. Um, whether or not this is going to be really definitive conclusions is another thing, but for in the Relagolix arm, um, 2.9% of patients had a major adverse, uh, cardiovascular event defined as stroke or MI compared to 6.2% in, uh, Lupulite arm. Yes. Um, if you had a previous history of a stroke or MI before, um, in the rel Golex arm, 3.6% versus 17.8%, um, which are significant numbers. So if you've had a patient that, that does have a, a adverse cardiovascular event in the past, you, you do need to be cautious with these medications. Yes. Now, you already brought up, do you have to be cautious with cancer? Yes, you do. Um, and so it, it takes a multidisciplinary management in some of these patients. We're often managing these patients with cardiologists. Now there's a whole field of cardio oncology yeah. uh, that is very excited by this paper. Um, this is the actual incidence rate. The, the question that we have here is um, when do these events occur? Um, and is this due to flare or not? Um, so if you look at the Lupron arm, um, you're getting a number of major adverse cardiovascular events early on, even within the first four weeks, and the curves separate. Yes. Um, now, I'll make a couple of points here. We don't know anything about each individual patient here that had an event, so we can't say, is this testosterone? We also can't say, is it another medication you got? So did you get um, an androgen receptor inhibitor? Um, and could that have contributed? We right. just, that data is not available to right. us. I see. Yeah. From, uh, from the events that are here. All we have is, um, what's shown. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think you're making an excellent point, which is that it is plausible that most of the separation is from early testosterone mediated CV events. The other thing I would point out is that, of course, there's a secondary endpoint and they don't have the power to really find a difference here. Um, you know, that perhaps future studies would lend clarity, but it's important to keep a close eye on these patients and, you know, know when you start somebody on Lupron, Daguerrelix, those are the two things you would start them on. You wouldn't ever start them on Rulugulix or whatever it is. Um, you, when you start them on the things we start them on, um, I think it's important to keep a close eye on them, make sure that if they have chest pain, they're known to call the doctor and those things. Um, but you're right. I think it's an interesting signal they see. Um, and if the company really wants to develop their product, I think they should just pow- they could consider doing a, a proper trial and powering their trial actually to detect a difference in um, survival. Because if they think these MACE events are really major MACE events, then they'll find a survival benefit. But I don't think they will find a survival benefit. And I don't know what these MACE events are because I think, you know, it's, MACE events sound scary, but we always want to dig in deep and make sure we know exactly what type of MIs we're talking about, what type of events. Um, some are scary, uh, but some are... Um, I think the product of some definition drift that we've written about. Right. So I, I, yeah. the reason behind this is what, what we need. Yes. Dr. Burns, I'm really glad that you picked this paper to discuss because it made me think of the old quote, you either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. And the hero trial, it's living awfully long, if you ask me. It's living awfully long. And so it's not faring too well in my eyes. What do I not like about this study? New company comes along and they make an oral drug where you didn't even need an oral drug. You have a depot drug that works just fine. You make a drug that nobody ever needed. You need to sell your drug. 
you if you go head to head against the shot that has the same mechanism of action, which would be the logical thing to do, the scientific thing to do, you are not going to win superiority. You're probably not going to be able to even do non-inferiority because the event rate is so low, your trial is going to need to be supersized, jumbo-sized to even run. I think some statistician should comment. How do you do non-inferiority trial if there's no events? Um, at, they don't want to power for any clinical endpoint, which is often the case with um, you know these kinds of studies. So they power for a fictitious endpoint. I'll call it fictitious because I think it's an absolutely meaningless endpoint of testosterone suppression. And they picked a time cutoff that is only going to penalize Lupron. And of course, they announced themselves the winner. And they're counting on the fact that people are not going to know enough to believe and, and instead believe that this T benefit is going to carry on to clinical benefit. Um, so I think it is... It is a villain study. It's not the hero. It's a terrible, terrible study. And it tells me nothing. And it's squandering patients. And it's, an ex it's probably going to be an extremely costly drug. And I think no one should ever prescribe it. And that's why I'm never going to need to know how to say it. Because anytime anyone ever mentions a name to me, unless there's some new data that comes out, I'm going to say, don't give that. That is not a good thing to give. That's All my right. take. It's that, that's my harsh, harsh take. Um, you're much, uh, you're earlier in your career, you're fairer than me. You become less fair with time, um, or or more fair, depending on how you the world is. Um, so, what do, what do you think? Um, I think that your bottom line is when you, when you say I'm not going to give this to anybody. That's the question: is where are we going to use this? Yeah. Um, and so, I do think um, I, I, people are going to consider this in the um, the garlic space, right? Um, but when do you need a pill over an injection early on? Um, people are going to consider this for intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. And um, can we, you know, test the waters by tipping our or putting our toes in and then taking them back out? Um, or is it really, from a disease standpoint, better to just jump in the pool? Um, yeah with a, a three-month injection. Um, oh, that's a great point. So let's talk about that for a second, Dr. Burns. You're a smart man. Um, I think that Dr. Burns is giving free consulting advice to the company, which is that if you want to study this drug further, the place you would think about is to run your own continuous versus intermittent strategy trial. And one of the advantages of your drug is when you turn it off, the T comes back quickly. You know, many of, one of the common complaints in the prior, the Maha Hussein study and the Crook study on continuous versus intermittent is that one of the reasons we would even think about intermittent is that patients would get a break from testosterone suppression and feel better. But the truth is when the, when the drug has such a long acting uh, effect, you don't feel better right away. It takes a long time for T to come up. And so actually in intermittent doesn't actually give the quality of life benefit people would have hoped. But this drug is fast on, fast off. So if you were to advise the company, I would advise them the place you would look is you do a continuous versus intermittent strategy, maybe in the biochemical relapse setting and run a different trial. So Dr. Burns is making an excellent point. However, I actually think there's another thing that's worth stating is I'm not sure you're going to win because maybe one of the reasons why the Lupron Crook study is not inferior, but the Mahu Hussein is not, maybe one of the reasons why is because Lupron is slow off. If Lupron was fast off, maybe it would be worse than continuous therapy. So this drug will allow us to really interrogate the continuous versus intermittent hypothesis. I think that's good from a scientific standpoint, but I'm not confident they're going to win. They might even show us the importance of continuous therapy, in which case we don't need the pill anyway. We can go back to the depot injection, which is much more logical. Right. I, I think that's exactly right. It is, it is new. It works differently. And so in that space, it gives us a new thing to test. Yes, uh, a new thing to test, a new concept. I agree with that. Um, so, you know, I'm really glad you reached out to me and you picked this paper because this was a paper that I didn't, I'll be honest, I saw it, I glanced, but I didn't look at it hard enough. But the moment you flagged it for me and I started to look at it, I, I was like, oh my God, it's perfect paper. I wish I had picked it. Um, and I think, you know, you did a really expert job of laying it all out and you're thinking about it, um, which I think is really good and fair. Um, again, I have to come down really, really harsh on this study because I just don't see, I mean, it's just a classic non-inferiority trial where prima facie, there was no reason to be non-inferior. And, and, and then the endpoint is driven by these, this, this, this phenomenon that is well known um, and not clinically relevant, which is that the T takes a few weeks to go low. Um, I mean, it, it is a, it has been used to get approvals in the past. So that's, that's why they did it. This is aimed at approval. Yes, um, of course. Yes. So, so yes, I know. I mean, in other words, I guess 
it's part of the thing I like to say, which is that let's not blame the tiger for being a tiger. The tiger, the company, wants to sell their lucrative drug product. Do they really, you know, that's their goal. And they know the FDA is lax. And so, you know, the failure is not the company. They're the tiger. They want to eat something. The failure is the rest of us who've let the tiger loose through the town. Um, that's the failure. And in this case, the failure is that the regulators allow this ridiculous study to lead to drug approval. I mean, I think the, the grounds for drug approval should be to prove that you, under sort of any sort of real world conditions that your drug improves something that anyone actually would care about. Um, uh, I love those secondary endpoints. Day four t testosterone level. I, you know, like as if anyone has ever looked for a day four testosterone level, but that's a secondary endpoint. Of this, you know, it's, it's, it's funny almost, but, um, so it's, it's the villain trial, not the hero. Uh, it lived too long. It became the villain. And, um, you know, you did a great job presenting it. And I think your points are, are well taken. I'll give you the last word. Yeah. Last word. The one final point is going to be, I'm, I'm going to medical, medical oncology, right? Uh, so I do worry about patients with metastatic disease. Yes. And um, the, the new standard of care is becoming combination therapy yes. uh, um, with docetaxel, avaratarone, apalutamide, enzalutamide, um, and more coming. And so if you're going to say that androgen deprivation using a pill is important, it also needs to be important for everything we're going to use it with. For That's a patients. good point. Yeah, I mean, you're right. You're so right in the sense that um, what you're saying is that, you know, before you give this pill in combination with any of those other things, of course, this trial prohibited many of those other things being in, given in combination. So you're going to need a whole lot more information. Um, that's well put. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the, I guess the last thing I'm going to say is, do you listen to, uh, I, I actually never asked you. Do you listen to this podcast? I hope I hope you listened to some. The last week, so it was great. Okay, thanks. Um, you had people in the past by listening to your fellow last week, and she was great. Oh, she was terrific. Yeah, um, uh, Kareen uh, Tawaji. Um, she was terrific. What about? Um, do you listen to other oncology podcasts? Ooh, no, you're the most, you're the main one. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Well, but no, I was the point I was just going to make is I've listened. I listen to a lot of them. I listen to every podcast I can find. And the point I was going to make is you never hear a journal club discussion like this on another podcast. You only hear the pros. You'll never hear anything being eviscerated like this ridiculous study. It's just a ridiculous I, 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 I promised you the last word. I'll give you one more last word if you have anything to say, but I just want to go one more time. I mean, just what on what earth do they think they're fooling anybody with this primary endpoint that, of course, you're going to have a lower T early? You're an antagonist. It's an agonist. What are you thinking? Of course. I mean, all right. So thanks for coming on. Any final thoughts? Um, you've given the listeners a lot. Um, it's a great, a great choice. No, final thoughts is that we're still going to need to define who is the appropriate patient for this. Um, given who was enrolled in this trial, I think the actual um, clinical usage is going to be a, a much, much, much smaller sliver of patients. Yeah. Um, finding that I, I don't know that this does that yeah and uh it's a pleasure talking to you, dr burns and we'll have you back for for more gu oncology hopefully thanks for having me you've been listening to season three of plenary session plenary session is produced by kiana klosner music by ian straley and audrey tran the views expressed on plenary session are those of whoever said it and no one else Plenary session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.